There we go. There we go. Uh, well, hey, it is good to be here uh, for sure. And uh, as all of you heard, Andy and Leanza had their little baby girl. Let's give God praise for that. Yeah, God is good. He's halfway there. I got four. He's got two, but we'll get there. We'll get there over time. Um, but it really is good to see all of you. And I just, I say this every time I'm here, I just praise God for what he's doing in this place. I really do. And uh, every time I come, I see new faces. I see new families. I see new folks reaching out. And uh, don't take that for granted, you know, what God's doing in this place and what he'll continue uh, to do will be great. And I am looking out, and I see Mike and Leslie Cola and the family. Mike and Leslie lead Trinity, and they help plant this church. I think we give God praise for them, too, and what God's doing in this place. What's up? Well, I want to start off uh, with a little story. I attended a church when I was in college that was probably one of the the craziest churches you can imagine. It was a charismatic, liturgical, Episcopal church. It had incense and sacraments and some crazy, awesome, just like worship, electric guitars, drums, robes. It was wild. It was pretty wild, but I loved it. It was amazing. And every week we would do this kind of responsive reading, and then we would say in unison, Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We said this every single week, and for some of you, maybe you say that around Easter time or whatever, but every week we would say that. And so I want to start the service by kind of reciting that phrase once again. You'll see it here on the screen, so you can't forget it, and it's these final four words I want to emphasize today. So you ready? We're going to say this together. Here we go. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. All right, we're going to say it one more time. I'm going to have you shout it this time. So here we go. One, two, three. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Woo! Christ will come again. Christ will come again. That is very, very important for us as followers of Jesus to know that Christ will come again. Because it changes our perspective. (sighs) Shock you the first time you hear it, but I just, I want to share this because this is our perspective. The final act of salvation is not for us to go to heaven to be with Jesus, but for Jesus to come back to earth to be with us. Did you know that? for God to return and be with us. So I want to talk to you today about a message. I'm calling it how it ends, how it all ends. How does this whole thing come together and at the end of the day wrap up? We're in week five of a series. Uh, First week was about the Garden of Eden and how God dwells with us in the garden. The second week was how God dwells in us in the tabernacle. Week three, how God dwells with us through Jesus. Week four, how he dwells in us through the Spirit. And now week five, how God is going to one day dwell with us in the new heaven and new earth. And I can't wait. I'll be honest with you. Um, I can't wait. So I'm going to read a passage for you uh, just to help continue to share this perspective that we are one day going to have God with us, not necessarily us be somewhere else. I want to read this from Acts chapter 1, verse 10. You remember Jesus has ascended to the Father, and, and this is what we read. They were looking, the disciples, intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. This is what they said. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So notice what they didn't say. They didn't say, hey, guys, keep looking up because one day that's where you're going to be. Or he didn't say to them, hey, guys, hunker down and just circle up with all the other believers because we're going to ride out this storm and then one day we'll escape through this like extraction theology and 
head on up to be with him and leave hell in a handbasket and all that kind of thing. Instead, he said, I don't want you to look up. I want you to get busy doing what I've called you to do and living out the kingdom of God because one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to be with us. And this was the perspective of the early church. The perspective of the early church was that one day Jesus is going to come back again and restore all things. I was sharing some of this with my parents last night. They were asking, hey, what are you teaching on? What are you preaching on? And I'll be honest, they kind of were looking at me a little puzzled, like, okay, I thought it was about us going to heaven when we died. And, and I had to say, that's true, but not ultimately. Like, ultimately, we will actually all live on the new heaven and new earth. And it dawned on me, man, I... I think this is something we don't talk about enough, maybe as believers, so I just want to kind of lay it out for you today. What happens then when you die? If Jesus is coming back again, and if it's all going to kind of come into the completion, restoration of all things, then what happens to us when we die? I thought we went to heaven. Well, we do, so let me just kind of unpack this a little bit, and I'll start with the story. The story is of a Texas man. I lived in Texas for about six, seven years. He was standing in front of the the pearly gates. Probably looks something like that right there. I don't know. St. Peter said, sir, have you ever done anything worthy or outstanding in your lifetime? Texas man looked up. He said, well, Mr. Peter, I sure have. In fact, I was in a little cafe in the desert of West Texas when a motorcycle gang stepped in. They grabbed the waitress and began to assault her, and I stepped up to their leader, the biggest one of them all, and I slapped him right across the face. I told him, back off and leave the woman alone, or he would have to answer to me. Wow, says St. Peter, that's amazing, but I'm, I'm looking through my records here. I, I don't have a record of that. He said, when did this happen? The man said, oh, about five seconds ago. And this is kind of our image of heaven right here, right? It's, it's like clouds and pearly gates and cherubs with heart, harps, you know, and, and we're all kind of floating around. Jesus has got on like the, the white gown. His hair is flowing, you know, and he's just walking and everything's in slow motion. And we just worship like forever and ever and ever. It's like an eyeball on the beach and sand of eternity or whatever it might be. And I think for us, that image of heaven being like it is, is a little strange because it feels like, gosh, that's not like embodied. It's not like, it doesn't feel as full maybe as it should. Well, well, it's not the right image, number one, but number two, it's actually not probably where we're spending like all of eternity. It's actually called the present heaven, the present heaven. Uh, In other words, the the present heaven is different than the sort of future heaven. So, try to explain again. My uh, wife's grandma, Gigi, her name's Helene, but we called her Gigi. She died uh, a while back, and she was 93 years old, amazing woman, loved Jesus. And she was lying in the casket in the funeral home, and, and we were kind of at the visitation. And my oldest two girls... Uh, at the time, we're like three and five years old, and so we're looking at Gigi, and she's lying there in the casket, and my oldest daughter looked at me. This was the first time we had to talk about death and dying with our kids, and the oldest daughter looked at me, uh, Natalie, and she said, why is Gigi lying there? And Claire, my, my three-year-old, she said, she's just sleeping, Natty, don't you know? And then Claire looked at me, Dada, why is Gigi sleeping? And it dawned on Natalie what was going on. And she said, Claire, uh, she's sleeping because she died. I said, you're right, Natty. Gigi died. And even though her body is lying there and it looks like she's sleeping, her soul is in heaven. And you could just see these kids' minds whirling. whirling, and, and, And Natalie said, well, then, Dad, I don't understand. Where is Grandma? I said, honey, grandma is with Jesus, but her body is here. 
and, and they're just kind of stirring there for a little bit. And, and I try to explain the best as I could, and I figured they would respond with something like, you know, oh, Father, thank you for helping us grasp the eternal nature, nature of reality and the tripartite nature of humanity. We're so thankful to you. But instead, I think my mo like mom had some cake, and they just disappeared and like went off to the other room. That is a good question, though. Where is grandma? Where is grandma? Because we just buried her body and it went six feet under. So was that not grandma? Or was that grandma and maybe grandma's somebody somewhere else? And theologians talk about the place grandma is. And, and it's a place uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 talks about. It's the present heaven. Paul says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We do have hope. Grandma is somewhere else. Grandma is in a place, the present heaven, a place I call kind of the green room. It's like the green room. Uh, if you ever heard of a green room, a green room is a place that the the speaker, the presenter, the person prepares in order to go out for like the final act of the production, the final act uh, on the stage. So you go in the green room, and the green room's got some amazing food. The temperature's great. The people are waiting on you. They, they can't wait to, to see the final performance. The green room is like a little paradise. I've been in a couple green rooms, and I just think to myself, Good night. I just kind of want to hang out in the green room. Like, this is amazing, you know, snacks and drinks and, you know, I haven't necessarily had a shoulder massage. That would be nice, though, in the next green room. But things like that, you know. Randy Alcorn in the book Heaven, he writes this. Um, he says, when a Christian dies, he or she enters into what is referred to in theology as the intermediate state a transitional period between our past lives on earth and our future resurrection to life on the new earth. N.T. Wright calls this life after life after death, the resurrection. A survey was done at Wheaton College not too long ago. How many of you believe in the bodily resurrection of the dead? And I believe it was somewhere around 40% said they didn't. But that's a core doctrine of Scripture, like the Apostles' Creed. We talk about the resurrection of the dead. Jesus calls it paradise in Luke 23, 43. He says, today, to the thief on the cross, you will be with me in paradise. Paul says that when people die in Philippians 1, 23, he said, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, he says, I would prepare... A I would, how's it go, prefer to be with the body. Man, I got to get my screen working here. Maybe it's not working back there. Anyway, um, I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So Jesus will be there. The angels will be there. Grandma will be there. At least her soul will be there. Paul describes being caught up in the third heaven which was kind of strange, and he didn't know how to describe it. In fact, he says, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. Like, I completed the race. I finished the race. I'm in heaven. I don't know if I'm in the body or away from the body. It's kind of weird, but Jesus is there. His resurrected body is there. So let me try to give you an analogy for how this all works. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, <clears throat> the author of Hebrews uses this way of saying it. He says, <clears throat> therefore, since we're surrounded by Grandma Gigi and that West Texas man and your parents or grandparents, whoever, such a great cloud of witnesses, we should throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. 
I picture, and I want you to picture just kind of this gigantic stadium, and there's a track there in the middle, and runners are running. And those runners that are running are you and me. I want you to think about this maybe uh, like you would a marathon. Uh, Anybody here ever run a marathon, just out of curiosity? Oh, come on, put them up nice and high, nice and high. See, one one person, man, we got to get this church family like in shape or something. Oh, we got two, we got two. Uh, so I've never run a marathon either. I'm right with you. I can't, I can't uh, go off on you. I've never run a marathon. I hear it's pretty tough. I hear you hit a wall somewhere in there. But, you know, in many ways, the race of life is like a marathon. So I want you to picture this. All of humanity lines up at the starting line of a marathon. And it's a staggered start. Some people start right away, you know, generations and generations pass, thousands and thousands of years pass, and then the next leg, and then the le- next leg, and now Andy and Leanza have a little daughter, and, and that's the next leg, right? This is going to start their race, and they start this marathon. They start this race, and there's all these people in heaven that have already completed the marathon. They already ran the race. They finished the race, right? The course is gone. It's done. They've come across the finish line, and they're waiting, And then as new people cross the finish line, there's a celebration, and there's Gatorade and water, and maybe they dump Gatorade over your head or whatever it might be. And and, and you have this time of reunion, and it's exciting, and then you wait for the next people. Oh, here comes the next generation. You know, think about a grandfather, a father, a son, a grandson, and generationally, the grandfather crosses, and then the father crosses, and then the son crosses, and they're waiting for their grandson. And they see him racing. This cloud of witnesses is watching. And, and here comes a grandson. He's on mile 20. It's like, ah, oh, finish the race. Complete the course. I'm rooting for you. We love you. Come on. And finish the race. Completes the course. This has happened throughout all eternity. And all of the people that have gathered together in the present heaven, in the green room, in the place of paradise, the place of reunion, celebration with Jesus, they wait until finally the last runner crosses. And Jesus says to everyone that's completed the race, he says to everyone, um, it's time now for all of us to go to our even greater reward. 1 Thessalonians four sixteen and 17 say it like this. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and when the trumpet, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ, Gigi, right? Body will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, if you're still alive in the second coming, uh, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then something crazy is going to happen. Check this out. Revelation 21. And then John is seeing this vision as he writes this. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. It goes on. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. It goes on, and it says this, he'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, but the old order of things has passed away. And I love this at the end. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Winters in Westfield are going to be new. I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. This is how it ends. This is the new creation. This is the new heaven and the new earth. And yes, grandma is in the present heaven. She is in a place, the transitional place. But one day, Jesus is coming back again to make everything right. The Bible says the new Jerusalem 
It's going to be a city. I don't know what kind of city it'll look like. All I know, and if we go literal here with the book of Revelation, is 1,400 miles wide. 1,400 mile, miles long and 1,400 miles high. That's pretty good, pretty big, pretty big. Literally, it would be from Canada to Mexico, from California to the Appalachian Mountains. That's a pretty big city coming down out of heaven. It's going to have gates that are perpetually open. We're going to be able to travel in and out of it. There's going to be like some incredible things that we're able to do to journey, to explore, to rule, to reign, to have fun. Everyone will be united. There'll be no more night there, no more crying, no more sickness, perfect unity, exploration. I mean, I could just go on with my imagination of how beautiful and amazing it will be. Jesus Christ himself will reign in the city of this new place. We will worship him. We will rule with him. We will have treasure with him. I can't wait. The new earth won't be a time of going back to the garden. The new earth will be a time when God makes all things new and everything begins to take on a new reality and then the end will come. So I want to close with a a story. It's, uh, it's kind of a long story, so you can bear with me here, get comfortable, probably take uh, five minutes or so to read, but I just want to read this for you. And it's from a book called Safely Home, and it's a picture of what reality will look like when we have this new heaven and this new earth, okay? So just listen with me and... Um, I want to read this. The battle cry of a hundred million warriors erupted from one end of heavens to the other. There was war on that narrow isthmus between heaven and hell, a place called earth. The air was filled with the din of combat, the wails of the oppressors being slain, and the joyous celebration of the oppressed, rejoicing that at long last their liberators had arrived. The long arm of the king moved with swiftness and power. The hope of reward that kept the sufferers sane was vindicated at last. No child of heaven was touched by the sword that day. For the universe could not tolerate the shedding of one more drop of righteous blood. Heaven released its fury. Earth bled fear. It was the old world's last night. At the lion's nod, the angel Michael raised his mighty sword and brought it down upon the great dragon. His muscles bulging at the strain, Michael picked up his evil twin and cast the writhing beast into a great pit. The mauler of men, the hunter of women, the predator of children, the persecutor of the righteous, Satan himself shrieked in terror and the army of heaven's warriors cheered. And then The battalions of heaven gazed upon the face of the decimated earth, the scorched soil of the old world. Nothing but the king's word, his people, and the deeds of gold and silver and precious stones they had done for him during their days on earth was left. It was the last day of the old earth. It was the beginning of something new. Soldiers dropped their weapons. The crippled tossed their crutches and ran. The blind opened their eyes and saw. They pointed and shouted and danced, throwing their arms around each other, for they knew that anyone left on earth was under the king's blood and could be fully trusted. The king gathered children upon his lap. He wiped away their tears. The sound of a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and loud peals of thunder, shouted, Hallelujah! For the Lord Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. And all eyes turned to the king. The entire universe fell silent, anticipating his words. And faith in the team captured this so well in our worship. I will turn the wasteland into a garden, the king announced. I will bring here the home I have made for you, my bride. There will be a new world, a life-filled blue-green world greater than all that has ever been. The earth is mine again, and I shall transform it. My kingdom has come. My will shall now be done. Winter is over. Spring is here at last. 
A great river rose from the ground. A great roar rose from the crowds. The king raised his hands upon seeing those scars of the king. The cheering crowds remembered the cost of the great celebration. The multitudes innumerable began to sing the song for which they had been made, a song that echoed off a billion planets and reverberated in a trillion places all over creation's expanse. Audience, orchestra, choir, all blended together in a great symphony, a cantata of melody. All were participants, and only one was the audience, the audience of one. The smile of the king's approval swept through the choir, When the song was complete, the audience of one stood and raised his great arms and then clapped his scarred hands together in thunderous applause, shaking the ground and sky, jarring every corner of the cosmos. His applause went on and on and on, unstoppable, unstopping. Everyone realized in that moment with undiminished clarity in that instant, they wondered why they had not seen it all along. What they knew in that moment in every fiber of their being was that this person and this place were all they had ever longed for and ever would. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Wow. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Do you know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? If you know Jesus, somebody say amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you follow the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who's going to recreate this entire place, the heavens and the earth, and one day we are going to rule and reign and enjoy his presence? Amen. Amen. And if you don't follow Jesus today and he is not your king and you follow yourself or you follow other idols or other gods, I'm here to tell you this is how it ends. This is how it ends. Bow before the king of kings. Bow before the throne. Know that there's somebody greater than you in this life that's gone before you and paved the way for you to have eternal life that I just described. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Would you stand? And we're going to just get caught up in worship of the King of Kings. We're going to get caught up just worshiping this God, this incredible Lord. And as we sing, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this song is your repentance song. This song is you saying for the first time, I'm going to kneel before the King. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And for the rest of us, guys, I want us to sing this song like we've never sang it before. I just want us to worship the King. Are you all ready to worship? Can we just worship God? Let's give him a hand. Praise God. Let's give him a hand. You know the song well. You know the song well. Let's just sing it to him and give him all the glory. 